you know, during the last song, I'm usually trying to come up with something to say when it's my turn, but uh, I didn't have a chance to do that at all. You guys were singing so well, and I even sang along with you. Thank you all for doing that. We have the Exodus taking place. You know, I thought you were going to finally get to, uh, you guys know what the favorite song of parents with small children, the, the favorite Christmas hymn is, don't you? Silent Night. And uh, this week, I uh, uh, Hope posted on her Facebook that little Cindy, how old is Cindy, three? Going on two, little bitty, okay. Uh, thanks, Dad, for knowing, way to go. And uh, she, she mused out loud, she said, y- you know, you ever wonder what little children are dreaming about while they're sleeping? And uh, this week, Cindy, in her sleep, was saying, chips, chips, chips. <laughs> and so Hope said, that little girl loves her free, her, her Cheetos, right? That's what it was. Well, uh, in a few minutes, we're going to get to the dream of Joseph, really important part of the Christmas story. And we started uh, last Sunday with a series, four-part four series. It's taking the Christmas story in chronological order. And, you know, that's sometimes hard to even come up with, and it has some surprises along the way. And I shared with you how my first Christmas as a born-again believer, I wanted to read the Christmas story out of the Bible for myself, and I couldn't even find it because I thought the Christmas story was the beginning of the New Testament. And when I looked to Matthew and saw the begats, I was really disappointed, and I didn't know where to go. But uh, there is some confusion uh, about the chronology if, for the casual reader of the Christmas story. Because last Sunday, just think about it, we started the story, the first part in this chronological series, Joseph's perspective of the Christmas story, but we didn't start in Matthew. We didn't start in the first book of the New Testament. We started in Luke, but that was the beginning. Chronologically, that would have been the beginning. And so how do we sort all of that stuff out? Well, there's a book that some real smart guys, a bunch of scholars got together, and they, they made what is called a harmony of the Gospels. And it's one, one book that puts together these four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, gospel accounts, all together in one volume. And then it goes to a lot of trouble to put those, all of those stories in chronological order because that was not necessarily the, uh, the priority of those who wrote the gospels. And as, uh, so that's just one of the surprises. And last sun, Sunday, you know, we had this up there. How many of you who are here for today, for the first time, and we're here last Sunday, have seen the uh, error in this uh, needlepoint deal? Or somebody said it was something besides a needlepoint, whatever it is. Merry Christmas. Instead of Merry Christmas. And my friend who has put that up for 11 years before she caught that, the surprise. So we're, we're looking at some of the surprises of the Christmas story along the way. And Joseph really had a surprise in his part of the Christmas story. And uh, we're going to get to that in just a few minutes. Let me finish up with a chronology, you know, a harmony of these four Gospels, just a few minutes. Think of it this way. Um, if you were to ask me to recount the event that took place in our home Tuesday night, I would tell one version of the story. But if you were to ask Kelly about the event that took place in our home on Tuesday night, she would have a different perspective. And that's one of the reasons why we benefit from four different perspectives of the, those who are inspired to write these stories that we call the gospel. But if you were to ask Kelly, she would say something like this. Oh, the kitchen smelled so good, and the house was so decorated so nicely, and there was an ambiance fire in the fireplace, and then the folks who came brought the best food, and they enjoyed it so much, and the conversations around the tables were so meaningful, and isn't it good that these really busy medical students take time out of their week to come and be together and share this Christmas meal? She would be sharing you about how it felt to be there. That would be Kelly's perspective. Now, if you were to ask me, I would say, well, Kelly started cooking the turkey probably about 2 o'clock, and then she was scurrying around lighting all the candles, and people started coming about 6.30 or so, and I would tell you what food they brought, especially Elliot, who brought these great homemade rolls were his grandmother's recipe, and then I would tell about how many people came, and then when they finally left. So you would get the facts from me but you would get the feeling from Kelly. 
And actually, we see that in these gospel stories, too. So not only did they, they have four different perspectives, they had four different target audiences that they were writing to. Let's go in, you know, the order in which they're written, they're recorded in the Bible. Matthew, remember who he was writing to? The Jews, who knew all of the Jewish history. And he was referencing the hundreds of prophecies that were fulfilled in the life of Jesus so that his fellow Jews could on board and buy into Jesus being Messiah. The first one, Matthew, written to the Jews. Mark, what was it, who was it written to? To the Romans. They were the just the facts, ma'am, kind of guys, kind of like me. And uh, who Jesus was to them would be defined by what he did. So what did Mark talk about? The things that Jesus did. It's called the action gospel. It goes from event to event to event, just recounting the facts. You know, what did Jesus do? Okay, let's get to Matthew, Mark, now to Luke. Luke actually wrote a research paper, and he went and interviewed eyewitnesses, and he put it into what he called an orderly account because he was writing to a friend of his, Theophilus, who is a Gentile, and Luke was the only Gentile who was inspired by God to contribute to the writing of the Bible, wrote Luke and Acts. And so he was writing to his friend, who didn't know any of those stories. And so the audience depends on what we would write as well, wouldn't, wouldn't it? Okay, and then when you get to John. John was written last, and the people to whom he was writing would have already seen. Mark for sure, Luke, Luke and Matthew likely. And so he was saying, all right, guys, you know the story. Here's what it means. And so it's the most theological of the gospel stories. See how that works? You know, the different perspectives of each of these, but also the different audience of each of these written differently. How many of you ever send a, a text message or an email to the wrong person? Yeah, you've done that, haven't you? A few weeks ago, uh, you know, in my travels, I usually end up the evening with a text Kelly, and, and uh, this one, I remember clearly, I said, uh, have, a, have a good sleep, love you dearly. Put my phone down, went to bed. Next morning, I woke up and checked my phone, and I realized that I had sent that to my secretary. <laughs> and that is still true. Kate, I love you dearly, too, but not in the way that you may have thought last night. And so that their audiences were different and their perspectives were different. Think of how complete and whole that makes the gospel account. Well, that's why we look at, you know, last week we looked at Luke and and Luke was recounting mostly, remember, Mary's story, the part of the, the Christmas story. And today, we're going to be looking at Joseph's. And we go back to Matthew, and uh, actually starting the first chapters. But if you go ahead and open your Bibles, do so with me. Turn to the uh, first chapter in Matthew, and you will see the, that surprise that I uh, encountered my very first time reading the gospel and uh, trying to read the Christmas story, and you see the story of the begats. See what that is? The genealogy of Jesus. Forty-two generations. But then there's a little bit of a problem. As you read your way on through the New Testament, if you get to Luke, you'll also see a genealogy. But those who are skeptics are quick to point out, wait a minute, see there? All this was made up because Matthew's genealogy is different from Luke's genealogy. Gotcha. It's not the same. There are errors in the Bible until you look at it more closely. Remember, Matthew is recording Mary's perspective. So guess whose genealogy, I mean, Luke is recording Mary's. So guess whose genealogy is in Luke? Mary's. And Matthew is recording Joseph's take on the Christmas story. So guess whose genealogy do you see there? You see Joseph's. And so there are answers to these questions that we can have. And so there's the genealogy. But let's not miss it. I realize that it's kind of ins as inspiring as reading the phone book because you and I don't know these names and these peoples and the stories they represent. But remember who Matthew is writing to? The Jews, the Jewish people. They knew all these people. They knew the stories they represented. And because they knew it, these are the things that they would, would not have missed. Look in um, the third verse. talks about Ju Judah. Guess who Judah was? He was a scoundrel. 
he sold his brother into slavery. And so as the Jews would, write, would read this, they'd go, wow, Judah is a part of this deal. And then later in that same verse, Tamar is mentioned. And that's one of the X-rated stories of the Old Testament. The Jews would not have missed that. Well, let's go on down. Let's see. David, in the second half of verse 6, you know the story of David and the scandals there. Remember, he's the one who saw his best friend's wife taking a bath and so he called for her because the best friend was out of town know where his best friend was he was off to war David was the king his best friend was off fighting a war and David had an affair with his best friend's wife and then guess what she turned up pregnant so what did he do about that he conspired to have his best friend murdered terrible stories you're saying man see those are the kinds of things that would not have been missed by this Jewish audience as they read through these stories Let's see I skipped one back there uh, verse 5 Rahab she was a prostitute Old Testament story Ruth she was not even Jewish but married in married Boaz and so even this what looks on the surface like uninspiring why is all this even here there's even a story there isn't there you know the Christmas story was it God's plan B Jesus born in a barn wasn't something he had to come up with on the fly because things had gone poorly no this was God's plan from the very beginning and he shows us and he shows everyone who reads the story this genealogy that for 42 generations a sovereign God was carrying out his plan and even when there were people who were doing despicable things even God's plan didn't go awry because of the misdeeds the misbehavior of the people who played important parts in that story a lot of comfort there for me that uh, you know God is in the practice of hitting straight licks with crooked sticks and there's one of the records of it right there people who did poorly but God's will still got done okay so that brings us to Joseph's part of the story and let's read along and you see if your take isn't what mine would have been that Joseph wouldn't have said you've got to be kidding me start in verse 15 it's verse 18 the font is getting smaller and smaller in my Bible I didn't leave it out in the rain and it's not shrinking but it's verse 18 and let's read this story together. Read along with me, and I'll interrupt us a few times along the way, and we'll some the, see some of the things we have to learn from Joseph's side of the story. Here, here we go. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married. She was engaged to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Now the text keeps on going. But there's some things that happen, some real important things that happen that are left out between verse 18 and verse 19. Well, let's go ahead and read verse 19, and let's go fill in the gap, okay? Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. So here you have this couple, teenage couple. You know, it's an arranged marriage. Their parents have already entered into contract. That would have been the engagement period of time. The marriage has not been consummated. The next step in their engagement process and marriage process. But then Joseph finds out. Well, how do you think Joseph found out? Now, an angel came to him, but not yet. We're going to read that in just a minute. But last week we wrote about, read about how the angel Gabriel came to Mary and said, Mary, have I got a job for you? And he told her that she was going to become pregnant. And you remember her question? How? I know how that works, and I haven't done that. I'm not going to do that. How? And so it was disconcerting, disconcerting to her, remember? It was scary. It was like, this seems impossible. But then the angel went, went ahead and told her the story about her, who I presume to be her aunt, 
and Elizabeth, who's also with child, but impossible on the other end of things. She was too old, really, to have children now. And so the angel said, your aunt's going to have a baby, so you can too. And then it says Mary hurried to go, and she visited with her aunt, and she stayed there for three months. Okay, get the chronology. Mary finds out from an angel that she's pregnant. And she leaves for three months. She's not talking to Joseph. She's away in another town and spends those three months with her aunt. And then after the three months, she comes back. And I'm wondering if, if because for three months, Mary was gonna, trying to come up, how in the world am I going to sell Joseph on this story? What is Joseph going to think? Hey, Joseph, that. I, I, I think I forgot to tell you. We're going to have a baby. And I think she was trying to fit. There is no way this conversation is going to go well. Oh, but I'll explain. An angel came and told me. And Joseph's going, yeah, right. An angel told you? Because think of it. Here's Joseph. He's been working. Remember, he's a carpenter. And whether that meant that he was a, a bricklayer, an abanil, or else a carpenter with wooden things, he's been working all this time. And he knew that he didn't make his contribution to this that Mary has just told him. And how convenient that you've been out of town for the last three months. Do you think Joseph was easily sold on that story? Put yourself in his position. <laughs> Wow. Well, let's keep on going. But after... Oh, and we already read, you know, the verse that he, he didn't believe her because what was he going to do? He was going to put her away quietly. Now, if you read back in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, you know what was his rightful response to this claim that she was pregnant? Lawful? He could have had her killed. Or at the very least, in this culture that shame is real prevalent he could have just shamed her publicly but he wasn't going to do any of those things you know and he knew that everybody's going to find out because the, everybody would have known this was a community event everybody would have known that they were engaged and then when she shows up with a kid in six months guess what they're going to think of him but he was willing to keep that to himself because he didn't want to shame her publicly. A really noble man, this Joseph guy. All right, let's read some more. Verse 20. But after he had considered this, he already came up with a plan, just put her away quietly. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Now, we talked about angels last week, remember? And the angel Gabriel had already shown up. He showed up to, uh, remember, Zechariah? Plain, plain day, daylight, walking, talking, breathing angel. And the same way the angel appeared to Mary. But you remember what the angel had to tell both of them? Calm down. And it was startling. You know, tranquilate. And, and the angel's going, you know what? These last two times haven't worked very well. I think I'm going to try this one differently. Because I scared those people last time. And I don't like scaring people. So I'm going to be a little bit more suave this time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to appear to Joseph in a dream. So a little bit different strategy on part of the angel this time with Joseph. So after he considers, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, here's the angel talking to Joseph while he's sleeping. Not about Cheetos. Joseph, son of David, still had to tell him this. Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. That story that Mary told you is true. She will give birth to a son. And you, Joseph, are to give him the name Jesus. Because he will save their people from their sins. Verse 22. All this took place to fulfill. Remember Matthew's writing to a Jewish audience who knew a lot of the prophecies. 
All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and they will call him. There's that cool Christmas word, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Okay, look at the impact that this dream had on Joseph. When he woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him to do and took Mary home as his wife. Remember when the groom takes the wife to the, the uh, fiancé home? That's where, to his own home, that's where they would have normally consummated the marriage. But he took her home as his wife, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. And he gave them, gave him the name Jesus. So, I had some pictures along the way to give us a mental picture of how maybe the conversation went between Mary and Joseph. And does that communicate to you what it does to me? She's saying, you're not going to believe this, but this is true. And I've had it confirmed by Mary. Yes, an angel appeared to me. And Joseph is going, you got to be kidding me. But then, God didn't leave it at that. And there's, here's a message for me too, and, and you too, isn't it? You know, God doesn't play hide and seek with us. He wouldn't call upon us to do something and then hide what it is. You know, if he, if he would want you to teach a Sunday school class, he would speak to you deep in your heart and ask you to do so. He, he doesn't leave us to grapple and try to make a, our own way. But he, he delights in letting us know what he wants to do in our lives. And, of course, it was in a dream with Joseph that he did that. And uh, I don't know about you, but I've not seen an angel in person, and I've not seen one in a dream yet. But you know what? Muslims all around the world are dreaming about Jesus these days. And I work on college campuses with students who are friends with those Muslims. And those Muslims come to them and say, you know what, this Jesus you've been talking about, he appeared to me in a dream last night. Let's talk about Jesus. That's happening in the world today. Yeah, it really is. So, the angel, this time it, he wasn't named. We can assume, maybe, it doesn't really matter, whether or not it was Gabriel, the same angel that appeared earlier in this story, but uh, anyway, he appeared to him in a dream. And then Joseph says, I got it. This is going to be hard. And we had this tidy little plan all worked out. And all our families were a part of it. And our honor had been preserved. But there are people who are not going to understand. And people, just like I didn't believe you when you told me that far-fetched story of an angel appearing to you in a dream. You know, we're going to uh, appear to you in person. Well, you're going to tell them that an angel appeared to you in person. I'll tell them an angel appeared to me in a dream. But you know what? I don't think they're going to believe us. You know, they'll be counting the months. And it will be six months after I took you home to be my wife. That this little baby's going to be born. And they can do math. And so for the rest of our lives, we know that we're doing what God has told us to do. But there's going to be a whole lot of people who are saying, yeah, right. you got to be kidding me. Sounds like a far-fetched story to me. Well, which part of the Joseph side of the story, you know, resides with you today? Which part? You know, is it the part that says, oh, no, I can't believe God would interrupt my tidy plan? And calling me to do that. Calling me to talk to that person. Now, I'm on the way to work and that guy has a flat. Too bad. But that our plan may be interrupted. That we can be open enough to hear from God when he prompts us to say something or do something for someone. Or maybe even a role to play in this church. You know, one of the coolest things that I enjoy so very much. Friday night was yet another example of it. This is a church where a whole bunch of people have been called by God to come and play a role. And you do so 
faithfully. And this is not the performance of a paid staff. You know, there wasn't a paid staff person in the room Friday night. It's people who've been called by God, and they said, okay, I'm going to do what you said. Isn't that the cool part of the Joseph story? All right, this is going to be hard. There's going to be people who don't believe. I didn't believe at first. But God has made it clear to me. And so you know what? I changed my mind. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do what God has called me to do. And so that that would be the surprise part of this Christmas for us. That we would embrace again, you know, the possibility that there is a sovereign God who had his plan from the very beginning. He made you and me so carefully and with such planning and diligence. And no, there's nothing that you and I have done to mess up God's plan for our lives. In fact, he's even able to make the things that we've done and take those and put those pieces back together. And then we get to have a story for others that they will believe because of the brokenness because of the problems just like it is right there in the genealogy of Jesus so the Christmas story it keeps on having some some surprises along the way doesn't it and that I will see it again this Christmas you know I I, I hope every Christmas I have a new surprise part of the Christmas story and get to see it more clearly and get to see what God has done more clearly well, let's pray and then we'll have a time for invitation if there's something you want to pray with me about, I'll turn the mic off and you can come and share that with me and we'll pray together. If there's something that you want to say, you know, Joseph finally had to say to the people around, you know what? I believe Mary and I'm taking my place beside her and I'm going to walk with her and we're going to do this together. So if God's calling you to commit to a walk with him and do this together, do life together with him, you can do that today too. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Then his marvelous story has so many parts from different perspectives and different actors and different players. But then each of us gets to see ourselves in this story and get to see ourselves as those who are loved so much by you that you take the initiative to come to us and to speak to us personally, to speak to us clearly. So I thank you for that. Let us respond like Joseph did. Amen. Let us respond like Mary did. Okay. Amen. And let us do that too. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.